You may think that you're watching a dolphin playfully spinning and looking through a glass, but what you're actually doing is you're watching a dolphin watching itself in a mirror. We're actually looking through a two-way mirror, and this is a dolphin seeing itself in a mirror, watching itself play. This dolphin is a thinking dolphin. It's a dolphin that shows mere self-recognition, a form of self-awareness. And I've had the amazing opportunity over the past 30 years to work with some remarkable minds, dolphin minds, elephant minds. Now, these are really big brains. And you can see our brain is at the top of this image. But look at these other two brains. There's the human brain at the top, in the middle is the dolphin brain, and in the bottom is an elephant brain. These are not only big brains, but they're complex brains. They're packed with neurons. They're highly convoluted. These are big, complex brains. Now, I've used the mirror as a tool, and it's a simple tool, to really try to understand the level of consciousness or this aspect of self-awareness in these other minds. And mirror self-recognition in humans is considered, a is considered one aspect of our intelligence, an important hallmark of our intelligence. It's an index of self-awareness. Now, we're a very narcissistic species, and we take it for granted that when we look into a mirror, that it's ourselves. And we use mirrors in all sorts of ways to check ourselves out. We're interested in what we look like. But mirror self-recognition is rare in the animal world. And aside from humans, there are only a few species that share in this ability. So this is, uh, my, this is my sort of token human, Franz Duval, who studies primate behavior. We share, but we share this ability with our closest relatives, the great apes. So mirror self-recognition was shown originally by Gordon Gallup in, in chimpanzees, in bonobos, or uh, the pygmy chimpanzees, in orangutans and gorillas. These are all the great apes, and again, these are, our, these are the animals that we're most closely related to. Interestingly, there's a dichotomy when we look at primates between those primates that show mirror self-recognition and those that do not. So above the line are the great apes, below the line are monkey species, and they don't show mirror self-recognition. Interestingly, the great apes also show empathy, the sense of caring for others, putting themselves in the place of another, where monkey species generally don't show empathy. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. There was actually one monkey species that showed mere self-recognition, but that's kind of a, another story. But in general, monkey species don't show it. Now, in humans, mere self-recognition first emerges at about 18 to 24 months of age. And this, this develops with other aspects of self-awareness and theories of mind about others. This is just around the age when children are developing all sorts of neural connections, and they start showing concern about the plight of others. Let me talk about how we look at mirror self-recognition in humans and non-human animals, because the question often arises, well, if you can't ask an animal if it recognizes itself in the mirror, a non-human animal, how do we know that they understand it's themselves? And that's a really important question. Gordon Gallup first came up with this approach working with great apes, with monkey, uh, with, the, with the chimpanzees. So what you do is the basic approach is you expose a chimpanzee or a young child to a mirror and you watch what they do. So we just call that, so that initial mirror exposure, we see that first, you see a first stage and there are three basic stages. The first stage is exploratory or social behavior. And what that means is the child or chimp looks at the mirror, may look behind the mirror, over the mirror. They're testing out what that's about. Again, this is a new novel object. And it's often trying to look around the mirror to see if there's somebody there. And in this stage, you'll also see social behavior. So the, 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 the chimp or the child will act like they're looking at another chimp or child, and they'll act socially towards the mirror, perhaps aggressively, perhaps in a friendly fashion. The next stage that you see is called contingency testing. And this is something that you may recognize yourself doing. If you walk into a shop and there's a TV monitor and you're not sure if you're seeing yourself, you may do some repetitive behaviors or maybe wave to see if that's you that you're seeing in the monitor. I'm gonna let Groucho show you what this looks like. So this is the kind of behavior where it's marked by highly repetitive behavior and odd behavior. And this is where 
the organism, again, chimp child, is figuring out and understanding that their behavior is matched by what they're seeing in that mirror or that reflective surface, that they learn something about this one-to-one -one relationship. This is where the light bulb goes on. So once you see this kind of highly repetitive behavior, you see a third, a third stage emerge that we call self-directed behavior. And this is where the, again, child or chimp understands it itself in the mirror and may look closely in their eyes, open their mouths wide, explore their mouths. They look at parts of their body that they can't see without the mirror. It's called self-directed. And many of us know what we do in front of a mirror. We try out that new dance step. We try our clothes on. We look at ourselves. This is a tool for us to see ourselves and see parts of our body we can't see without the mirror. Once this is shown, then we use a mark test. And that's simply where you mark and you mark, put a mark on the body, and the question is, will the organism go and touch the mark on their own body in front of the mirror? And here's just a little video showing a chimpanzee that's been marked on its head going to the mirror and touching the mark. And the mark test further confirms that the organism understands it its, itself in the mirror. Now, bottlenose dolphins are the species that I've studied for the past 30 years. And I thought they were really good candidates to study mirror self-recognition because they're very similar to chimpanzees in many ways. It's been said that dolphins are the cognitive cousins of chimps. They're very different looking, evolved from a very different path, yet they show remarkably similar behaviors. And with dolphins, again, they have large complex brains, and the brain of a dolphin again, is larger than our brain, but their bodies are bigger than ours. So dolphin brains weigh about 1,700 grams. Our brains are about 1,300 grams. So size itself may be important, but we have to think of size relative to body size. So here's just a little schematic comparing brain size with body size of humans, great apes, and dolphins. And you can see that a human brain has an EQ or encephalization quotient of seven. And this means that our brains are about seven si times larger than they have to be to, to run our bodies. If you look at this, the numbers for the great apes, they range between about 1.8 to 2.4, and or 2.3 or 4. And for the great apes, dolphins come in at 4.2. So their brains are larger relative to their body sizes than, than, it, than, of the, than the great apes. They're, they're the second largest brain to body size on the planet. Again, we don't know what equates with intelligence, but the complexity of the brain, the organization of the brain, and the EQ correlates with more intelligent behavior uh, in a variety of different species. So here are these really big brains. What are they doing with these brains? And we know that they're highly social, highly complex creatures. They live in what we call societies, or what I call societies in the sea. They have long-lived relationships. They have to remember the animals they're working with. They show a high level of cooperation, and they form long-lasting bonds. Youngsters stay with their parents until they're four or five years old. And again, they have to store a lot of information and remember who's who. They don't have cell phones, but they have very complex social networks. So we have these complex societies in the sea. We also um, know that dolphins show empathic behavior. And I mentioned earlier that humans and great apes that show mirror self-recognition show empathy. They show caregiving to others. And since ancient times, there have been reports that dolphins will rescue sailors. And we hear this in myths and recorded stories. I get a number of calls. Uh, about from people who tell it, who say to me, I was actually rescued by a dolphin. And as scientists, we have to be careful not to overinterpret this data. But this behavior is not hardwired. They show quite a good deal of flexibility. It's not like dolphins are hardwired to hold up injured people or injured animals. They're selective. So we think that this, again, is, is good evidence for empathy and understanding the plight of others, being it their own species or other species. Now, dolphins also show 
comparable cognitive behavior with the great apes. I'm going to show you a couple examples from my lab. This is a beautiful silver ring, and we often give dolphins objects of play. They play with objects in their own environment. I now study them in the wild, and we see them playing with seaweed and a variety of objects. But lots of animals play. But what's interesting about dolphins is that we did a study showing years ago that dolphins actually form their own objects of play. Here's a dolphin blowing a beautiful silver ring of air out of their blowhole, which is their nostril at the top of their head, and the first ring catches up with the second ring, and they swim through it. This was the first evidence we had of a dolphin making their own object of play from something they've blown out of their blowhole from their body. Now, here's another example. This is a two-and-a-half-year-old dolphin named Bailey at the National Aquarium figuring out another way to make a bubble ring. She never saw anyone do this in her pool, and she blows out a little bit of air and kicks it with her tail, and it forms a silver ring, and she plays with it. She played with these rings for two hours straight, two and a half years old. That's a longer attention span than two and a half year old children. That tells us something about the nature of their intelligence. Many years ago, I did a study giving dolphins an underwater keyboard that they could interact with. It was interfaced with a computer. The dolphins would hit a visual form, they would hear a computer-generated whistle that was different than their own whistles that they produce when they communicate, and they would get an object for play. I wanted to ask the question, what would happen if we gave a big, brained species, like the dolphin, an interactive system? They were fed ahead of time so they weren't hungry, and they had toys all night long. Then we gave them a 30-minute session each day with this interactive, touch, this interactive screen. And here are some dolphins, Delphi and Pan, who were interacting. They're big hams, so they're kind of looking in the camera at the cameraman. But what they did was they showed self-organized learning without our intervention. We simply gave them this touch, this uh, interactive keyboard underwater, and they learned associations on their own between the symbols, the visual forms, the sounds, and the objects. They started to imitate the sounds. And here's a beautiful example of the computer sound, the model, and the dolphins own rendition of that sound, and they learned after very few exposures, just a few exposures, and they started to imitate very well, but they started to use those sounds as they played with the matching toys. And we even had examples of them using those sounds in exchanges between them. So now we're creating a new kind of digital touchscreen so that we can go on and further explore this. But again, without our intervention, they showed striking patterns of learning, very much like what we see with young children learning la the early stages of language. So I thought these animals would be really important to look at in terms of mirror self-recognition. Here is one dolphin named Presley, and we did this study at the New York Aquarium and published it in the National Academy of Sciences, showing that dolphins, like us, recognize themselves in a mirror. So we marked the dolphins in different parts of their body. And here's a little video showing dolphins taking toys to a mirror. Um, once the dolphin was at the mirror, they started showing the same stages, the same three stages. The looking at the mirror, looking at their eye close up. Once they started looking at the insides of their mouths, exactly what we see with kids and with the great apes. Doing the groucho, interactive, highly repetitious behavior. And once we saw that, we actually started to um, mark them in different parts of their body, and they raced to the mirror and oriented the marked part of their body immediately to the mirror and looked at it. So if we marked them on their head, they would orient their head and look at it. If we marked them, here's the dolphin racing to the mirror and looking at that part of its body. Now, in just a minute or so, you'll see a, the dolphin being marked under its chin area and going to the mirror after, after it's marked and looking at the chin. Now, here, this is a dolphin that we pretended to mark under its side fin and it's looking for a mark. It thinks it's been marked, but we only marked it with water. We pretended to mark it. Yet, it thinks it's been marked. This is an animal with something in mind. They have a sense of self. They understand that they can use the mirror as a tool to view themselves. And in this video, you're seeing dolphins being marked, a dolphin being marked under its chin. And it's going to race down to a mirror that's in the pool, in the other end of the pool, and start lifting its chin and looking at its chin. And here he is watching itself in the mirror. Again, this was published in 2001, showing the first evidence that you don't have to be a primate to understand a sense of self. This is a very young dolphin. Just in the first day of mirror exposure, these animals had some prior exposure with reflective surfaces. This dolphin is very quickly understanding 
that it's itself in the mirror. It's starting to show self-directed contingency testing and self-directed behavior. That squeaky sound is just its little beak rubbing on the wall. First day, and he's about a year and a half. He's actually a little bit, a little younger than that. And this is a paper we're just getting ready to submit for publication now. I also felt that elephants would be extraordinary candidates for tests of mirror self-recognition. They sh share many of the same traits. I said the abilities that I talked about with dolphins. Uh, they show empathy. This is a, just a slide by Ian Douglas Hamilton, a photograph of one elephant that's showing caregiving to a non-related elephant. It's pushing it, it's trying to lift it up. Finally, it helped it to its feet, non-kin related. Um, elephant, we, Franz Duval, my colleague, and his graduate student, Josh Plotnick, and I gave, dolph gave elephants at the Bronx Zoo a jumbo mirror. We wanted to see what we would see, and basically, we marked them the same way, followed the same procedures, and elephants, like dolphins, this is one elephant that's marked, and we pretended to mark her with an invisible mark on the other side of her head, we, we found the same kinds of behaviors. She's touching the mark. She never touched the mark until she got in front of the mirror. So we can say that Asian elephants also show mirror self-directed behavior. And we just got new data at Smithsonian's National Zoo, where I also do my research. This is another elephant touching the mark. So we have two more elephants joining the ranks. And again, they, like dolphins, show this level of self-awareness. So we can see now that we've got this, this group, a very small group. By the way, magpies also show it. This is a crow species with a very large brain-body ratio. We see evidence for cognitive convergence in this ability in these, in these species. It's a small and rare group. Now, I just want to say that as a scientist, I was always told, keep your science and advocacy separate. They're separate, separate spheres, spheres of activity. However, Every year, 23,000 dolphins and small whales are inhumanely and intentionally killed in Japan. In the, there are these dolphin drives that happen every year starting from September to April, and dolphins are killed because they're considered pests, predator, pre pests and competitors for fishermen in Japan. Many of you are familiar with the film The Cove. Um, looking at this picture, it's hard to look at this. From, from what I've seen, what I know, very hard to accept that this is happening to these highly, highly intelligent animals. 36,000 elephants are killed in Africa for their ivory every year. 100 elephants a day are killed in Africa, and they are intentionally killed for their tusks. Again, we see families of animals being shot down, killed, cut open for their tusks. It's hard to hear. Now, seeing what I've seen, knowing what I know from these animals, I cannot keep the science and the advocacy separate anymore. And I think that it's important to bring them together. I think it's the responsibility of scientists to become advocates for the animals we study. We have to have scientific advocacy. And I've been arguing now that what we need is what we, a new kind of translational science. We embrace, we value the idea of translational science when it results in new medical devices, new biomedical breakthroughs. But what about a new kind of translational science where we can take what we know about other species and translate it to conservation action, to global protection for these amazing species? We need global protection for dolphins, for elephants. And I think we need to have science informing our policy. We need to have science informing policy. Our scientific knowledge needs to transcend cultural and geographic boundaries. What we know in one country, it's not just limited to one country, it transcends all countries. We have to increase our pool of knowledge across boundaries. This is going to take a lot of people, and we're going to need people from many, many different domains, from government to courts to citizens like you, to educators really getting this message across. So what I want to end today is this, a, a few comments that I want you to take with you. First of all, scientific facts are powerful. Many of you are scientists in the audience. Many of you are not. They are powerful, OK? Scientific facts can really make change. And we can change policy with facts. And I want you to help me, and I want you to help the elephants and dolphins by taking what you hear today and spreading the word. I want everybody leaving here thinking dolphin. I want you to think dolphin. I want you to think about what we talked about, what you heard. I also want you to think elephant. 
leave thinking elephant. Think about what's going on with them and what we all know about them now. And I hope that we use our big brains to save these big brains. Thank you.